This is another lecture in the in the home study course. This time we're covering the topic of education with Professor Robert Murphy. And let's first address, we're presuming that the readings are covering lots of the history from Rothbard. So um, in this discussion, we'll cover, cover some of the more uh, theoretical aspects of, um, of public schools, uh, state control of education, the viability of a market order, and some other topics along the way, whatever happens to come up. Let's start with the, the first, first issue of why it is that uh, uh, education is considered a public good. Or is it usually considered to be a public good in the economic liter economics literature? Yes, it is. And that it's interesting, just the, the terminology they employ, that it's called uh, public schooling. And so right there, that loads loads the issue against the person who wants to argue for private provision. So really what people mean when they talk about public schools, of course, are, are government schools. And then I think even myself, I fall into that trap when I'm writing about this, and I always try to come back and, and correct myself and go through and, and change any place where I put public school to government school so that I myself am not perpetuating that stereotype. And also, just as an aside with this term, terminology, the really what we're talking about in this area is – is formal schooling and not education. And so, again, to talk about public schools providing education, the you don't want to fall into the trap of saying, oh, are you for or against education? Because, of course, we're right. all for education. And so the thing to remember is whether or not someone is compelled to sit in a, a particular building and hear instruction from designated experts, that doesn't mean that person, therefore, that's the only route to education that people on their own can can read and so forth and that people can continue to learn to receive an education well beyond formal schooling years. So I think we need to keep those issues in mind. But to go back to what you were asking, yes, in the mainstream literature, education is considered a classic public good, perhaps second only to defense or provision of a legal structure. And the, the argument runs something like this, that it's true when you go to school and receive instruction, it raises your productivity and so it directly benefits you, but it also has spillover effects, positive externalities on everyone else in the society. And so that's why it's in the public interest to both have uh, compulsory attendance laws and also to have state funding of education. That if there's a person who's too poor to go to college, for example, but yet that person's an excellent student and, and would do well, then the argument is, oh, we should use tax funds to send that person to college because it's going to benefit the rest of us as well. So as with most arguments of this nature, I think one of the major criticisms that the advocate of the free market could level is that you need to focus on the actual decisions on the margin. And so just because something has a spillover effect, even if we concede the legitimacy of, of that way of thinking, it doesn't necessarily follow that therefore provision will be too small in a market setting. Just to give you an analogy, another example they often use is when it comes to vaccination. And the argument there is the government needs to force everyone to get vaccines because even though left to their own devices, most people would choose to do it, you're only narrowly considering your own selfish benefits and you're not considering, well, if I catch whatever this communicable disease is, then not only am I sick, but then I'm going to spread it to a thousand other people. And that the argument goes, if you were forced to externalize, internalize all those externalities, you would then choose to get the vaccine, whereas left to their own devices, people are too uh, short-sighted and too selfish to think like that. But if you think about that, it, it's true, theoretically, you could des devise some sort of model in which people are neglecting those, those facets of the decision. But in reality, I think most people, just considering my own benefit, do I want to get polio or tuberculosis, they're going to get the vaccine even though they're disregarding the fact that, oh, well, if I get this, then I'm going to be a person to spread it on to others. And so in the same way, when it comes to education, even if we concede that, yes, of course, other things equal, if someone's educated, that's better for everyone else in the society as well, it doesn't follow that, therefore, that person can't be trusted to choose the level of his or her own education on their own. And so I think that that's the, the primary objection to the public goods argument in terms of just the the theory of it, is that on the margin people will choose to get education. That, for example, literacy, it's not as if 
people aren't going to, because of the benefits to themselves of becoming literate, that they're going to choose not to learn how to read or that parents aren't going to teach their children how to read because they're neglecting the spillover effects to everyone else from having one more literate person in society. Yeah. And so that's, I think, the, the, the major theoretical problem with the public goods argument. And then, of course, just the practical ones that, for example, another it, – it's, it's really the same argument but a different way that they usually – frame it is that they say there are benefits to having a responsible informed citizenry in a, yeah. in a modern democracy we need to have educated citizens and that's why mm -hmm. and so we could go through that argument i just gave you more a more theoretical one and, and say well is it really the case that you wouldn't want to be an informed citizen on your own and you need to be forced to but even beyond that just to look at in the real world does anyone think that the U.S. educational system right now is churning out informed citizens who are making responsible decisions at the ballot box? And I think most people would agree that that's not the case. Just with the the anecdotes, the funny things we hear about how, what percentage of high school seniors knows where particular countries are on a map and right. and what the U.S. Constitution is or what year it was signed and things like that. That clearly the system is not producing well-informed citizens. And so if that's the argument for so-called public education, then I think it's obviously been a failure. Well, one of the rejoinders to that is that, well, look, if you, if you uh, 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 reduce the amount of funding available for public education, you can only make the system worse. Right. You could yeah. say that about anything, just yeah. as whenever a government program screws up, whether it's the war on poverty right. or inner city housing and so on, that they just say, oh, yeah, it's because we need more money. Well, speaking of things you could say that about anything about, um, uh, uh, I guess one of the Austrian criticisms of public goods – uh, type logic is that if you construe a public, public good broadly enough, e everything qualifies. Right, that's exactly true. So it's not just vaccines and things they really have made the argument for, but Austrians have taken it and say, why, if I put on a clean pair of socks in the morning, that that's a public right. good, that it, it benefits me, but it also benefits everyone else that I interact with, and it doesn't follow, therefore, that we need to subsidize people putting on clean socks. And again, it's I think we should think through as to specifically what's going wrong with the argument, the public goods approach there. Right. It's that on the margin, even though you have that spillover effect, just considering your own costs and benefits, most people are going to put on a clean pair of socks. And so it's the same thing when it comes to education, that the type of thing that people are talking about to, to learn how to read and, and arithmetic and things like that, stuff that you really need to know in order to function in society – I think people left to their own devices, even if they don't care anything about their neighbor's welfare, just in terms of their own marketability and, and what kind of wage they're going to get when they graduate, they're going to choose to get that sort of minimum education. Right. But as I understand the, the rationale for the, the public goods argument, it's not that uh, the market means won't provide education, that it won't, it's that it won't provide it in sufficient quantity or the type of quality, I suppose, that... Uh, that economists somehow know for sure as necessary. Right, and that's that's what I mean when I'm saying, of course, yeah. you could theoretically, if you're going to devise an actual model in the little world of the model, you can show that, oh, there's a market failure. Yeah. But what's crucial there is there needs to be a continuous range of of choice so that you're choosing to take 20 semesters of a certain in a certain area or a certain liberal arts education and so the argument would be, oh, left to their own devices, people would only take 14 semesters, whereas we know the optimal amount would be 20, for example, just to make up numbers. But if it's something that's a, a binary choice, such as learning how to read or not, well, then there, even if you accept the public goods argument, it's it's not going to get the inefficient outcome. Yeah. So it's it's not merely that the argument is contrived and that it does it's not realistic, but even on its own terms, it's, it has to be a very specific type of decision where there's a whole continuous range of things and then the idea is the market under provides. But you're right that it could be applied all over the place in any aspect of life and we could find that there's market failures and everything. I recall reading a, a, an unpublished paper by, by Murray Rothbard. He had written as a, as a graduate student and he was complaining that the uh, administration at the time, I guess it was Eisenhower or somebody, um, had been going on about the uh, terrible shortage of of mathematicians and scientists, you know that the mm. that uh, that the education system is not providing that, and that there needs to be some sort of intervention. Uh, well, I mean, we still hear that today, right? right? Just constantly, there's there's always somebody has a better idea about precisely what people ought to learn.
Right. Just everything in terms of research and development. I can remember even in graduate school that there were models of R&D. And of course, it was just obvious, y'all knew going into it, that <laughs> it was going to be the market can't do it correctly. And so it was, there's really a whole industry in mainstream economics of different ways the market can screw up. And by the market, they mean decentralized decision making where people decide things based on just their own costs and benefits. And it's ironic because it actually, you have to be clever to come up with ways that the market screws up because in general with a price system, people do what's the socially optimal thing going back to at least Adam Smith's formulation of the invisible hand. And so that's why it takes these clever PhDs at MIT to come up with all these models in which oh, the market's going to fail here. Right. But, but of course, it just begs the question of Therefore, since there's this theoretical market failure, the government, of course, can identify it, and we can trust the government to implement the solution. Right. Uh, well, the uh, the rigorous models aside, um, there is something like a public intuition that most people have that seems to suggest that education is is something like a service unlike any other. You know, that there there's a, a popular view out there that that really can't imagine. Uh, that that uh, that even though education is very much in demand by by everybody, it, it somehow wouldn't wouldn't be supplied. Right, that's true of a few other items. I think food and health care, and yeah. I suppose police services and firefighters and th things of that nature. That people just assume it's a it's a matter of human rights, and that everyone is entitled mm -hmm. to an education, and only a reactionary Neanderthal would say, if you can't afford to go to college, then you shouldn't go, or that it's it's not my fault if, if your parents aren't sending you to college or go get a scholarship, and if you can't, that's tough, that that sort of idea would just would shock people. And so it's, I think some of it is due just to the nature of education itself, it seems to be so important, and also it's such a laudable thing that people don't think that you have a a natural right to receive uh, cable television necessarily, although even that, as, as we get richer, more and more people would say that, yeah, you have a right to cable television. But there's something about education that it, who could possibly be against providing education to someone? And so I think that that's involved. But also just the fact that it, it has been this way for so long now that people are brought up in that frame of mind and just the idea of change shocks them. That if to have a, a private postal system, for example, that's an area where I think clearly the market would obviously outperform the current system because we have private alternatives, and yet people are just horrified. Oh, no, if that if yeah. that happened, then it would cost $15 to send a letter to Alaska. And I've, I've actually heard people make that argument, someone who worked for the post office, coincidentally enough. But that's, I think, clearly something that's just due to the historical accident that that's been provided by the government, so people assume it has to. But with education, I think it is the historical accident, but also something about it that it seems so important, and it is important. And there's this idea that if something's that important, we can't leave it to the vagaries of the market right. because the market might fail, whereas we know for sure, of course, government, when it sets out to achieve something, always always does it. Yeah. yeah I, I seem to remember in the, the mid-1990s, just after the web browser became sort of uh, uh, commonly used that it, it only took a few months before the Clinton administration was arguing that there was a, a, a digital divide <laughs> and that there had to be some sort of public provision of of these uh, services. So it doesn't take that long, but fortunately the market out outraced right. the public sector uh, and an education that seems perhaps one of the re reasons people have a difficult time imagining a market provision of, of education across the board is that. Um, development has been has been hindered, you know, by 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 the state in so mm -hmm. many ways. Right, that's true. That as in every other area, people look at things that are deplorable in the current situation, and they assume that's due to the the market, and they don't realize yeah. that actually it's the result of previous government interventions. But this is a very interesting point uh, because one thing you you notice about um, all debates about education and politics is that most everybody agrees in some sense that whatever time you're looking at, whether it's the 1920s, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, or now, that something is going wrong with education and it needs to be reformed. I mean, in my lifetime, I can remember just three, four, five big rounds of educational reform. Right. Yeah, and they have all these 
proposals, things like standardized testing is big with the Bush administration now, and they're trying to to hold public teachers accountable. And you understand what, why they they have this concern, because there is certainly data to suggest that the so-called public educational system or system of government-run schools isn't performing by any standard up to an acceptable level. And so people wring their hands and they want to say, what can we do? And of course, it doesn't occur to anyone, well, let's just abolish the whole system. That's unthinkable. So given that we're going to have this system, how can we tinker with it? And so the centralized bureaucracy administers standardized tests. And given what their goals are, that's understandable that they would do that. But then, of course, there's all the drawbacks that just talking with teachers who have to administer them. And just to a limited extent, in my own classroom, I you note that you have to teach to the test is the way they describe it. And especially in these failing inner city schools, the so-called problem schools, where they're going to get shut down unless they can bring up their students' test scores, what happens is people stop teaching about the world and stop trying to teach the kids to become good citizens and all the things that they're ostensibly supposed to do, and they teach them how to get a good grade on this upcoming standardized test. And for those who have read the, the book Freakonomics, one of the better chapters in that book is where he goes through and documents how he caught a bunch of Chicago school teachers cheating on the test, but, and there's all sorts of various techniques. One teacher, I think this was in Chicago, also went so far as to put the, the correct answers up on the blackboard and just told <laughs> the kids, and one of the kids happened to mention right. to their parents what had happened, and so that apparently that, that plot didn't last too long. But other ones were more sophisticated, and they would go through and, and take some of the, the problem students after the test was administered and go through and erase on the, the bubble sheets and put in the correct answers to try to bring the class's average up. And so in, in that book, for Economics, they document how they actually caught those teachers using statistical tests to pin down and say that it's impossible that your students improve so much from how they did with the previous and then in the succeeding year. But again, given what's happening in the system, of course, it's it's horrible that teachers would end up doing that. But what are they supposed to do? That they're teaching at this school, and presumably, if they're going into a government school, especially in a in a troubled area where there's gangs and so on, that they're they watch those those uplifting movies where people, dedicated teachers, go into those schools and turn it around and and get kids to get off drugs and and go on to college, and that's what they're trying to do. And then they hear from higher levels of the government that if your students can't pass these standardized tests on such and such a level, then we're going to shut you down or the state's going to take over instead of having the local government run the school. So given those incentives, it, of course that sort of thing is going to happen. So that's just one example of reforms that people try to institute. But no matter what you do, given the nature of the monopoly or that the government has on its own institutions and then even the indirect control it exerts on the so-called private sphere, those reforms aren't really addressing the basic problem. Right. So you're not denying that, that these reforms can actually uh, uh, improve if your standard is, imp improve the schools, if your standard is uh, uh, more kids able to read earlier or kids learning better mathematics by a certain age or whatever. I mean, it does seem like the data indicate that certain kinds of certain approaches to public education work better than others. Well, I would certainly agree with that last statement. I, if someone somehow made me czar of education, I imagine that I could institute reforms and that would bring up test scores. But even that, there it wouldn't substitute for if it were completely decentralized because, of course, just the standard argument for any decentralization is that whatever reforms I can cook up, I'm free to implement them in my own private school, and if it really is yeah. a great idea, then others can copy it. And maybe there's something I'm overlooking, or maybe it takes 15 people independently to come up with the 15 great suggestions and no single person could possibly come up with all the right ideas. And also, it it begs the question of what should be the appropriate standard. And so it's it's certainly true that if the government wants everyone to be able to do long division – I'm sure if they spend a hundred billion dollars and they threaten to fire teachers and and they give all sorts of subsidies to kids who can learn how to do long division so they can go on to college, that eventually mm -hmm. you could raise that number. Right. But you're raising it relative to the previous status quo, which was having a government run system where they didn't have all those incentives. So it's it's not hard to improve when you're starting out in an abysmal situation. 
it's not as if it would make more kids learn long division as would happen, I think, under a completely decentralized market approach. So there are probably, in the 1940s in the Soviet Union, there are better and worse ways to increase grain production, too. Exactly. Right. And it, and again, that's that's a great analogy because you can certainly pick one or two things that you want to focus on and able to you know, right. improve the report that you send up to the commissar, but is that really what the system needs or is that the optimal thing to do? And so just to go back to the education, yes, if you're cranking out a bunch of kids under the proposal who now can do long division and know the birth date of John Adams, that's great. But if they also now don't know the difference between a democracy and a republic or what federalism entails, and because some of those things are going to have to go by the wayside if we're going to focus now on making sure kids know how to do long division, well, then are we really doing what we're supposed to be, churning out well-educated citizens? And so, so it goes for all these arguments about whether or not the school should be emphasizing uh, more of the humanities or the arts or, or music or uh, these other things that are commonly called extracurricular. Exactly. Right. Or but, even even just within the the normal educational approach itself, just things that are in the standard curriculum. There's a there's scarcity there. There's you only got the kids so many hours per day. And if you stress one thing, if you want, if you really want them to pass that standardized test, then you can't fill in the other areas. And so you can certainly make a choice and then gear everything towards that. But the point is not merely that the choice might be wrong, but that also it's a you're imposing a uniform outcome on everybody. Yeah. And really, we're we have to be careful not ourselves to fall into this trap of saying, oh, the problem with the government runs schools as they do it this way, but actually it, should be done. it ought to be done this other way. Well, no, there, it's, there's millions of ways it should be done. Just like it wouldn't make sense to say, well, what's the right shirt to produce? That no, There's all sorts of different shirts that the market would produce, and that's what would happen. In fact, doesn't it seem like um, the public schools are sort of ripe for being captured by certain political uh, or cultural interests, you know, like – uh, in the six, 60s and the 70s, there was this this wave of open classrooms and, you know, what you might uh, associate with sort of left-wing theories of education. Mm -hmm. And then they get captured again by the other side and then captured again by the other side and so on it goes, sort of buffeted between these political winds. Which I guess you could make that that's one of the reasons you don't want a, a public school system, precisely to avoid this kind of... Right, that's certainly thing. true. The, the examples you're setting were a bit before my time, but even <laughs> in my own... Uh, experience, I've. It, it's certainly true that radical leftist ideology has permeated the public sector far more than the private. Whether it's environmentalism, so I just know anecdotally that when I was going through high school, my friends who were going to public schools, they were, and again, government schools, excuse me, right. they were learning about how man's destroying the earth and that the white settlers decimated the Indians and things like that far more than I was learning in my private Catholic school. And it's, it, it would be hard. I'm not sure that I could give an exhaustive description of why that's the case, but clearly we can see that it is, or even it's even more prevalent when you get to the undergraduate level that if you go to a, a little private liberal arts school somewhere that certainly the education you're going to receive is probably not going to be nearly as leftist and radical as if you go to a, a large state institution. And there's, again, there's all sorts of various factors. I imagine some of them are the conspiracy view that those who favor the government and are attracted to power would tend to go towards large state run institutions. They're very prestigious for those who, who like state power. Whereas people who are, old-fashioned and uh, conservative in a, in a cultural sense would tend to be attracted more towards a, a liberal arts school that's private. But it's, I think there, there must be other reasons as well yeah. for why, why is it that these radical leftist movements tend to take over at public schools. I think part of it is just the, the left prides themselves on being very tolerant, and so the the presidents of these institutions are very afraid to crack down on militant black groups, for example, or, or radical feminists or, or what have you. And whereas at a, at a private school, just by its very nature, they're more uh, exclusive and they can kick people out. Whereas at the state school, 
what their function is is to be the the repository for everyone else that the private sector won't accept and that we're here to ensure that you get uh-huh. your god-given right to an education or your earth mother right to an education depending on who's giving you the spiel there so it um i think that they are more willing to tolerate things that strikes the average person as just obscene yeah. and crazy and i can't believe what they're doing in college yeah. campuses these days and it's precisely because it's a very tolerant but defined of course to tolerate certain things they won't tolerate homophobia for example what right. they define is that but right. other than that i i I'm not sure what the precise reasons are, but clearly those movements do capture the the public schools far more than the private ones. You, you recall in, um, in Mises' uh, liberalism, he's talking about the, the market for education, and, and he raises the, the point that, um, or the implication that public education would probably work better in some, in some sense, if you can talk that way, in, in a, a culturally homogeneous and sort of linguistically homogeneous area. But, but once you introduce uh, diversity, then um, it, it becomes nearly impossible because the educational system becomes this sort of political prize. Right, that's exactly true. I I can't remember his exact wording, but he, I remember that he says something to the effect that the reader who has not grown up in, in such a hotly divided political area probably would think my words are, are an exaggeration, but no, in these areas where it's crucial that your which language your children yeah. have as their as their mother tongue where if if the rival faction controls the schools and that that's what the instruction is in that that can be a huge factor or a huge decisive victory in terms of the different groups competing with each other whereas in the United States for example although even there in, in some border regions there's the the debates over should we have classes in Spanish and so forth but to the to most people in the U.S., it doesn't seem that, that big a deal. But somewhere in Europe, if there are four different languages competing for um, dominance, that it could be a huge deal who runs the public schools. You're showing your age. I think it was maybe ten years ago in the California schools, English only was, mm-hmm. uh, was a big big deal, mm-hmm. hot stuff, and it could be in the future. Right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's jump from. Uh, from uh, uh, dreadful current conditions uh, and uh, the difficulties of reform, over to over over to a, a radical solution of of laissez-faire. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would be the legal apparatus that would oversee a laissez-faire educational system? What kind of regulations would exist, uh, if any at all? How would kids be protected? Okay, well, it depends what the what the constraints are here, if you're asking, you have to leave everything else the way it is, and what do you want to do with education? Then you would say, okay, well then, you would deregulate. The government would stop running their own schools, and depending on how far you wanted to scale it back, and you could, and you could make the, the moderate argument that, look, even if we concede that you want to fund poor students so they can go to go to school, it doesn't follow that the government has to run the schools just as in our society, we won't tolerate people starving to death on the street, and so we have all sorts of assistance programs, but it doesn't mean that the government has its own grocery stores and things like that. So regardless of one's views on the justification for government involvement, clearly there's no reason whatsoever on any account for the government to be running schools themselves. But then even there, that concedes far too much. And so I would say in the in the modern political context, if you're going to still have the rest of the state machinery the way it is, then yes, you would just deregulate and have schools that you need to run as a business just as if you were going to open a laundromat. You don't need special educational certification to do so. And of course, the the more radical solution would be just to get rid of the centralized state altogether. And then schools would be just as any other business would be regulated and so there would be a a, a network of a private legal arrangement where you have private judges ruling and that there that what you would have to do and this would be the same really under both alternatives is just honor your contracts and so parents would or students who are paying for themselves would enter into contracts with people who would say we're going to instruct your children here or you yourself if it's the student paying for it and these are the conditions, and you could do, in principle, you could do anything you want. And so some so-called schools, other people would probably say they're not even a school, could just 
watch they could watch soap operas all day. But the point is, you don't need the government to come in to crack down to to prevent that because pretty soon people who have a degree from this place where they really don't learn anything, employers are going to catch on to that and that degree is going to be worthless. Right. So market mechanisms would would kick in and reputational effects so that schools that really did produce students of outstanding excellence they would get a reputation for that and people would be willing to pay to get into that into those schools and they could be very selective and there could still be scholarships it's interesting if you stop and think cuz when i was younger i didn't really understand this but why do schools get scholarships in the first place because in the one sense, you feel that, oh, it's well, if, if you're really smart, then you should be able to go to school for free. Why should they charge you? But that doesn't follow in other areas. It's not that if you're really good at eating, you should get food for free. And so the question is, why is that? Why is it in the school's interest? And it's it's easier to understand athletic scholarships because then people go to pay to watch excellent mm-hmm. football mm-hmm. players. But even if you're the smartest kid in the country, people don't pay to watch you take a test or to write beautiful essays, and so it's not clear why the school benefits. But then if you think ultimately what is the school's product or service, that they're granting degrees that signify to the community that this person who holds this degree has received an excellent education, well, a lot of the learning that you do, especially at the higher levels, isn't in the classroom from the ter- the teachers alone, but it's also working in study groups and doing problem sets with your peers. And so it certainly does benefit the institution if 10% of their students are there free of charge, but they're really great students and they're the sort of person that in their free time would would love to help somebody else. Oh, this is how you do number four on the homework set. And that's the kind of person they want. So a lot of what currently exists in the educational market today, I think we would see analogs of that in the private setting. But what we wouldn't see is schools that are churning up kids who can't even read or who don't even have basic basic math skills, which is actually quite prevalent today because, again, if parents were paying for it, then they would soon enough switch over to schools that weren't uh, providing such shoddy results. And the thing that it's, it's ironic because the idea is now that by ta- using tax money and therefore making it free in a sense, at least in the marginal sense, to parents to send their kids to public schools, that that's somehow making education better because now it's available to all. But what ends up happening is the parents aren't directly considering how much is being spent on that because whether or not their child, for example, goes to the school, they're still being taxed. And so I think the incentives and the parents to make sure that their children aren't skipping class and so on, that it's much lower if their kid's just going to the public school because it's – whereas if the parent says, what are you doing? I'm paying however much a year for you to go to that school. You better show up to class or you're in big trouble. I think that is going to be more. And the other major difference would be there would be no compulsory school laws. Right. And that – so this goes back to depending on how moderate or radical you are that I think a moderate would say, okay, sure, we should – the government shouldn't run schools, but we could still have funding and we could still have – um, and we should still, of course, require that all students up to a certain age go to go to school because that's just obviously necessary. And there, even those arguments, again, I think are wrong, and that the radical solution is the correct one. So for the for the funding, just to touch on that for a moment, you, it depends how far do you want to push that because it's sort of like an arms race that we can have everybody get a the equivalent of a high school degree or almost everybody. And then we can give all sorts of funding to get them to go to college. But if everyone's going to college, then a college degree doesn't really signify that much. And I know that for a fact, just in my own classes, that if I had to guess, I would say maybe 20% of those students are really good students in the sense that they have the right attitude and they just like to learn, whereas the rest of them, I think, are there just because, oh, well, today's world, you got to get a college degree and my parents want me to go. And yeah, so I'm here and it, it beats working. Whereas if if a lot of the uh, state funding were taken away, then that w- there wouldn't be nearly that many students in the market for higher education. And again, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the equivalent of oh, so right now if you don't have a college degree, that would just be multiplied by two million students who now wouldn't be able to afford it. Well, no, because as the proportion of people having a degree went down, 
employer, employers would take that into account and then it it wouldn't be as if now all of a sudden everyone were unemployable. It would just mean people would take that into account and so those who went on to get the degree, that would be a better signal. Just as we could just take the argument and say, why don't we just have funding and make sure everyone gets a PhD or True. gets five PhDs. I mean, you could just right. take, push it as far as you want. Give everybody a PhD at birth and just save the money. <laughs> well, that too. So... So that's for the the funding that I think it shows that it's sort of, I said, like an arms race that we all keep trying to get more and more degrees that collectively it's not really worth it or we're wasting those are valuable years where we could have been out in the workforce or why don't you just have everyone, you know, stay in school until they're 35. At some point you realize it becomes absurd. And so the point is, why do we think that the government's magic number is better than what the market's outcome would be? But then to go back to the the other one, so so again, the, the the moderate might say, oh, okay, so we shouldn't have the government running the schools, and maybe we should even have the government funding it, or at least not nearly as much as it's doing right now. But clearly, kids ought to be forced to go to school at least for a few years. And even there, I don't think that that's at all obvious, because if you think of it this way, the sort of student who wouldn't go to school at all were it not for the government coercion being employed is precisely the student that you don't want to have in school. I mean, there are true social menaces that are in the government schools primarily because the private schools would kick them out, and it's not at all clear that that's even helping those children, let alone is it conducive to learning for everybody else in the classroom. If you, it's obvious in the case of actual bullies or people who bring weapons to school and, and physically injure their classmates, not only the kids who are injured, but just the fear it would create that that's not at all conducive to learning. And as I said, it's not even clear that we're doing a service by forcing those children themselves because maybe they want to go get a job and and maybe all things considered, it would be better to let them go work when they're sure. 13 or even sure. 8. And sure. that shocks people. But again, we're, we've focused the, the issue down on those children who are really troublemakers. And you say, okay, well, what about all the other children? And again, if the question is, what are we, what are we so afraid of? If everybody, if all reasonable people can agree that, oh, children should go to school, well, then send your own kids to school or homeschool them or take care of their education yourself. And why do you feel the need to impose that solution on everyone else? Because really what it is, is all of us right thinking people, we're worried about those few bad parents out there, then we're so much better parents than they are, and we can't trust them to raise their children the right way, and so let's coerce them. But again, it's precisely the children from those problem families that it's not clear you're helping anybody by forcing them to go to the school. It's, it's basically a mild form of prison that for your first, depending on the, the laws, 13 or up to 18 years of your life, you're basically forced to go to this building for a long portion of each day and, and sit there. And you, again, it's you're not learning if your attitude is such that you really do view it as a prison sentence, right? Um, well, um, Dan, I'm going to talk about some of the some of the uh, the booster clubs that are involved in mm -hmm. public schools. There's interesting stuff going on about about that. But um, but to get back to the the way that that the education market would look, and mm -hmm. you're not just to be clear, you're not suggesting that education would always and everywhere be a, a commercial thing plus scholarships, right? There are other things going on, other choices. I guess part of the difficulty is. To imagine the way um, education would look in a market setting, it, it would be as if, uh, perhaps as if groceries had always been provided by the state, and you and I are sitting here speculating what would what would uh, what would re re the retail food market look like under a market. You know, right. That's interesting that you bring that up because I had a student from the former Soviet Union just two years ago, and she was describing what it was like to get food, and and she said that. It certainly wasn't that there was little grocery stores down the street for everyone that people had to drive or take a train or what have you to go to the central distribution area to get their food and then go out because just from the, the central planner's point of view, that's what, yeah, it would be wasteful. Why would we build all these little mm -hmm. dinky grocery retail stores all over the place when we can just have all the customer, all the citizens come to the centralized area that's more efficient from their point of view. So I think that's a good analogy you bring up. And Part of the problem is that we it's hard for us to picture what it would be like, and that's one of the benefits and the arguments for freedom is that no group of people can put out the blueprint for how the system ought to look. And so you and I can speculate, but yes, I think no matter what we come up with, we're not going to be fully capturing the the availability of all sorts of options to people in a 
free market setting. But there could be things, especially now with the internet, there could be all sorts of online instructions, there could be academic institutions, things like the, like the Mises Institute, for example. Now part of the problem with the Institute conferring legitimate degrees or certificates or what have you on people is that outsiders are going to think, oh, well, they're not an official school. Or, mm-hmm. you know, they need to, and you can, of course, you can get the accreditation and so on, but there would still be this spell of you need to have a formal school to do something. And that in a totally free setting, I think that prejudice would be gone and people would realize that it doesn't matter so much how someone came to know something, but more what are the skills of this person. And so there could be all sorts of things, um, the equivalent of uh, a, a guild system, and not in the sense of restricted entry, but that people would go and be someone's apprentice and then learn a trade and, and move on. And who's to say that a child wouldn't be much better off doing that, working with a master carpenter from a young age and then going on? And you could say, well, how would he know about history and, and culture and, and poetry? Well, he can in his spare time read that stuff, or he could even – enroll in a particular class offered by some organization that specializes in poetry or what have you. But again, it's really what people are afraid of is that people are going to choose things that the critics don't approve of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, I've wondered sometimes uh, homeschooling is, is, is booming and it's Mm -hmm. just, it's just wonderful. Uh, But, but, but these days it's almost as if you have to, the, the, the market is so restricted that you either have to look like a regular school in the sense that uh, the state approves of. I mean, the regulations concerning schooling in Alabama, how to run a public school, uh, it really looks like a gospel plan. I mean, mm-hmm. just just endless pages of, of detailed regulations. Or you can secede from that entirely and just stay at home and have mm-hmm. have just a completely domestic-based education, um, which, for all its merits, does raise questions about the extent to which homeschooling uh, employs basic principles about the division of labor, for example. Right. You know. So um, uh, so the in-between stuff, it seems to be what's missing mm-hmm. today, you know, the subdivision school, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's it's a good point you raise. And it, Because on the one hand, I, I'm torn, because on the one hand, with an economics background, it does seem odd that, that parents would be teaching their children – individually in their own households for so long, especially if both parents are are productive and they could be out working that from a certain point of view, it seems, oh, isn't it more efficient for the parents to go out and earn the money and then pay someone else to train their child just in the same way that you wouldn't say we should have home operations and that everybody to make sure that you know I'm taking care of my child and I'm the one who cares most for my child that I'm going to do the operation, that that would be absurd for people to think like that. But at the same time, what what is cutting in the other direction that I've noticed, and this is why my wife and I plan on homeschooling children that we have, is that the the smaller the classroom, and even if it's just a few children, you can really tailor the education to the student and you don't sure. have to uh, teach to a certain group of the class. So in my own classes, uh, some advice that I got when I first started was someone said, teach to the to the top third, meaning that just figure out right away who the top third of the students are and then teach such that everyone in that group knows what you're saying. So it's true, the smartest kids in the class are going to be a little bit bored and the the weakest students are going to have no idea what I'm talking about, but, the, but their advice was suggesting that if you tried to teach to the middle, then everyone else is just going to adjust and the lowest students are just going to do that much less reading because they're going to, they're used to being the lowest students. And so the point was you got to just accept the fact that some kids aren't going to get what you're talking about and teach the top third. And, but the problem there is again, the top students then aren't going to be interested. They're not going to be challenged. And that's, that's happened with my classes that I've had some really great students and except if I completely changed the rules and graded them much, a much more difficult level just to punish them for being of such ability that they don't, they really didn't have to work at all and get an A from me. And it was, it was just, there's really nothing I could do about that. It was unfortunate. And so I think in terms of homeschooling, people say, Oh, I bet you, you know, your children are probably going to be really good students and really bright. And I do think they will, but it's not, it has nothing to do with, with genes or anything like that. I think all parents, if they homeschool have a tremendous advantage over 
teachers who have to work with a group of 30 or even yeah. 40 or 50, depending on the school yeah. students and, and instructing them. So that's, I think you, what you said is exactly right, that probably what would happen would be, it, it might even initially start out as a homeschooling phenomenon, but then a particular parent who happens to have a knack for teaching children of a certain age, maybe that parent's children are all just wonderfully educated and, and their friends realize it. And then maybe yeah. instead of sending their students to a private school where there's an enrollment of 30 or 40 per class, they put it, the kids there and maybe they renovate the garage and they have a more formal structure, but it's sure. still got that, the, the feel of a, of a homeschooling environment. And so the, that, dis, the, even that distinction would break down. Because, of course, there wouldn't be things that were zoned residential and zoned commercial yeah. in a private property order. And the, the distinction between, well, is that a, someone's house or is that a school? People say, oh, it's both. Yeah, sure. so, yeah. um, the I, more I, likely I the breakdown would, would go by subject, right? Right. Yeah. And, and again, and, and for some areas, maybe it wouldn't. Some, it wouldn't. That it clearly, yeah. a lot of things that you want to teach, especially just to, to younger children, the parent could teach most of that stuff, but if they want to teach a foreign language or a musical instrument, well, then no, unless the parent happens to be bilingual or to know how to play that instrument, there's nothing they can do. But the parent, of course, can teach the times tables and, and basic U.S. history and things like that. But it's, but it's an interesting point you make that, um, in, in some sense, having a private tutor is the ideal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of, I think, widely granted. I mean, if you look at you know, all the great figures in history of somebody and their private tutors, everybody recognizes that, but it might be too costly for everybody, right? Exactly. Right? So and uh, so uh, you have to consider the trade-offs, right? I mean, in the limit, unless I'm doing my math wrong, would that require that half the population teaches yeah. one person on the other <laughs> side? So yeah. uh, clearly, that can't be for it can't be for everyone just because it would be too costly. But it certainly um, you would want a private setting where those incentives would just play themselves out, and you could see what the what the costs and benefits were, and some students, as I say, I think it would depend how far they could go, and so if you were just one person's private tutor, and, and you're, you're exactly right, that that's probably why the monarchs in the past did that, that they knew that if you want your son to have the best education possible when he assumes the throne, then you find someone really smart, you pick Carl Menger and say, I want you to, to raise my son in terms of teaching him the ways of the world. And and that that's if that's what you want for your child, that probably is the best thing you could do. But yes, not everyone can do that. But then the next best thing is to send them down the street to right. the the school where they've got fifteen students in there. What's interesting about the advent of homeschooling is that maybe it's you know providing something like a benchmark, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for the future of private education. You know, we're send your kids to us. We're we're right. just as good as homeschooling. Right, and that's it's interesting because there are all these. I don't know if you've heard of these things, but where I teach, there is a certain backlash or just standard jokes that people make. We, we happen at Hillsdale to have a lot of homeschooled students, at least relative to other institutions, I imagine. And some of the professors, they make jokes when we're out at social events about, oh, I had a student come up to me today and, and like, she's never taken a test before. Come on, you know, haha, -ha, a homeschooler, right? Yep. And they, and they joke about it. And so I was on the lookout for that, but in my classes, the kids that I knew were homeschooled were by far the best students. It didn't mean they were the smartest people, but right. they had the drive and they were they were curious. They actually liked to read. If I said, by the way, this won't be on the next test, but here's a book that's dealing with this topic, those would be the students that might actually go out and look at it. And so it's it's true that this issue of the division of labor, that the randomly picked parent isn't as educated as the randomly picked teacher, probably in most of those areas, but nonetheless, just the difference of incentives and the fact that they get to lavish their attention on the one or a few children that they really care about, namely their children, and also that, again, you can tailor it so if, if your child is having difficulty with a certain topic, you can spend sure. more time on it. And so it's not even a, an issue of a sort of selection argument that all oh, the parents who are who homeschool tend to be more concerned about education and so therefore that's why their children tend to do better which i think is a valid argument is true but even all else equal if you can tailor the instruction to an, an individual they're going to do better you know I, I do you do detect a lot of public resentment against homeschoolers and it, and it does strike me that part of the reason is that homeschooling is something of a luxury good 
that mm -hmm. uh, a you know, pretty small segment of the population can sort of purchase in some sense with the opportunity mm -hmm. costs of, uh, involved. Um, but um, but I mean, be, but in a sense, you know, like Mises makes the point about luxury goods that you know, mm -hmm. under the right market conditions, right, they, they can be spread democratically. Right, that the the function, if you want to use that word, of, yeah. of luxury consumption is yeah. for the the rich to experiment and to find what is the, the sort of thing that would be that would appeal to a mass market, and so that the mass of consumers can see the rich guy with a color TV and say, wow, I'd like to get one of those, and then the, the companies know if we can figure out a way to produce it on a mass scale, it will be profitable. Going back to that distaste or uh, bias against homeschooling, I think another aspect of it, it's true, like as you say, that there's this feeling that, okay, well, the, the rich or at least upper middle class, they can afford to have one of the parents stay home, but the rest of us in working class, we can't do that, and so that's not a luxury we have. But I think there's also... A suspicion that it's it's very elitist that oh your kids are too good to send to the public school and and the people resent that aspect of it that parents who homeschool as they will often report well, the reason they're doing that is because I don't want them my kids learning the garbage they're teaching down at the public schools or I don't want them being exposed to the language they're going to hear on the playground and so I think a lot of people resent that and think that that's a form of elitism which I suppose it is but I think it's um, Justifiable. Yeah, sure. Um, um, yeah, you raised a point about the financing. It prompts me to ask um, about um, some of the proposals for reform um, include uh, something like charter schools, which you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. but also vouchers, which appeals to a certain intuition that many mm -hmm. people have that uh, that it's kind of crazy for all families to just pay the same amount for the public schools, whether they have kids or not, mm -hmm. uh, through the property taxes. But that there's a, a better way to uh, more closely connect the running of schools with the paying for the schooling, and that the, the voucher system is one way to do that, and that it would introduce a kind of competitive element into the existing public structure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's market economists who are promoting this. Right. Stuff. People who understand incentives. Right. This is the type of argument where people are going to be accused of being purist and unrealistic and they don't understand the political situation. So my take is I'm against vouchers and I have written on that. I understand where the advocates are coming from. So the problem is the, – the major danger that I see is that it would just be another way for the government to regulate even the what remains of the private sector all the more so. And so specifically, the, the route would be that in order for a school to qualify to get those vouchers, they would necessarily have to pass some set of requirements that you couldn't have the the building that where you go and you just watch soap operas all day and, oh, you're going to get tax money to have your children go there – that, of course, isn't going to happen. And so there must be some list of requirements, criteria that a school would need to pass in order to be eligible to receive these vouchers. And by the way, that seems to make sense. I mean, as a taxpayer, I don't... Right, you know, exactly. You know. It's it's unavoidable. You right. you would have somebody funneling money to their brother-in-law if, mm -hmm. if it weren't for those sorts of re regulations. It's just as Mises points out in bureaucracy that the reason the state has bureaucratic codes and all the red tape is because if it didn't and there was just this tax money waiting to be stolen by everyone, then it would it would be it would just be pure chaos. And so they need to set up these arbitrary benchmarks and hoops for people to jump through just to prevent people from yeah. blindly taking from the public till. Right. So given that then, the government is just going to have yet another means of regulating the private sector. Now people say pro voucher the pro-voucher side, they'll come back for that sort of argument and say, look, right now the government has the legal mechanism by which they can regulate the curricula and so forth of private schools, so vouchers wouldn't give them anything they don't have right now. But I don't think that's entirely true, that right now if there's a certain equilibrium that's been established as to what the government's legitimate role is in telling a private school yeah. what they can do or not. And that would be fundamentally altered, I think, right. if those schools were directly receiving – money from students that were getting the vouchers. And it and again, people say, well, what about busing and things like that, that the bus that takes the kids to the school, that's paid for by the government often. And 
and so on. But again, there's I think it's just a fundamental difference. And you could even push that further and say, well, if the if the president declared martial law, there's all sorts of things he could do. And that doesn't mean, therefore, that anyone who raises a worry about the government's encroaching power, it would be silly to say, oh, well, right now, if Bush declared martial law, he could do he that could anyway. Do so this right. measure, there's no danger implicit in it. That, so the, the fact is just because on the books right now the government could tell a particular school, we don't want you teaching anything that, that disparages the Republican Party, that even though legally they could do that, there would be a public outcry. And they would say, what are you talking about? You can't do that. That's crazy. Whereas I think if the government is funneling millions of dollars to a particular place and then the taxpayers don't like what's happening there, they could sure. truthfully say, wait a minute, my money is going to support that school and so I don't want people teaching that. That's crazy. Demand accountability. Right. Right. So that's so I think that's the major problem with vouchers. And then Lou Rockwell and others have picked up on the point, brings up the argument that what good public schools there are because in certain especially affluent neighborhoods there right. are public schools that they're not horrible or they're not the the nightmare image of gangs running around and, and kids not learning how to write by the time they graduate that that could very well be wrecked if they don't have any means of excluding yeah. people from other communities coming in there because they're backed up now with voucher money and so the the point is that it I think it's the exact opposite of the proponents think that by introducing more what I would call pseudo competition, that's going to raise the bar and force the public schools to improve their standards. But I think the opposite would happen. I think it would just wreck the what standards remain in the private sector and that there would no longer be this distinction between public and private, even as dubious right now as that distinction is for all sorts of reasons, that that would just be weakened even further. And if, if one concedes that... I think it's naive to assume what's going to happen is the excellence is going to pervade the government sector rather than the other way around, that the government's incompetence is going to influence the private sector. No, the, the response to that is, well, look, if you're a private school and you don't want to take vouchers, you don't have to. That's true. Again, I think there's going to be a problem with, first of all, just being short-sighted that the people running the schools, as much as we would like to think, aren't necessarily well versed in classical liberal tracks, and it's they might be thinking more of, wow, there's all this extra money, all these extra customers we could be getting, and probably the effects of the vouchers wouldn't really kick in until s several generations down the road, and so I don't think that necessarily the people running the schools are going to be making that sort of political calculation, right. just as. You could say if, for example, the Social Security privatization proposals, one of the major political dangers of that is to say, well, look, if, if we're funneling billions of dollars into the stock market, don't you think the government then would be able to lean on certain corporations because of that? And, of course, you could say, well, the, the, those corporations could refuse to accept the government money, but I think – that would be naive to expect that. And so the same thing with the education. And also just that if your competitors are accepting voucher students, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. Sure. And so and, – and even so, perhaps there would be a few handful of schools or more people would go into homeschooling. Yeah. But nonetheless, certainly plenty of people would accept voucher students. And the fact that so many free market economists and other activists are – cheerleading this movement, I think that they're wrong strategically, that it would be odd to think that the people running the schools are going to be not be fooled by the free market advocates championing the vouchers. So I think that that's, that's the danger and that the schools would go down that path. Um yeah, on the, on the, on the point about schools right of refusal, of, co of course, every business has the, uh, well, let me ask you if this, if this, analogy works, every business can refuse to accept credit cards, too, right? Right. So, um, or, or checks and only be a pure cash business, but that necessarily limits the size and they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Do you accept mm -hmm. that analogy? Right. right. Yeah. Right. And just even in, in higher education right now that Hillsdale and I, I think it's a few other places, one of its, its selling points that it, it it makes when it tries to get money from conservative donors 
is that we don't accept government money. Yeah. And and what that refers to is back when the government required schools to report on their racial statistics of their student body, Hillsdale refused. And the ruling was that if you have a student going to your school that in any way receives federal aid, well, then you're a recipient of federal money and we can regulate you. Sure. And so that's why Hillsdale adopted that policy. But the point is that it was a very difficult move because given that all the other schools are accepting students, well, then they can have gorgeous sports stadiums and they can have enormous libraries. And if you want to um, – my wife, for example, wants to study psychology and going to Hillsdale, they don't have a very – big lab and they don't have all sorts of money for running tests and things like that and running experiments on rats and all sorts of things like that. And so at these huge state schools or even private schools that are willing to accept the federal funding or other state funding, the product they offer in many respects is superior because they're backed up by so much money. And so the, the point is, yes, there could be a few outposts who cling to their independence and refuse to accept voucher students. But again, I... I don't think that that's going to stop the trend, and I think overall it would be the case that vouchers would hurt the private sector more than they would raise the public sector. Yeah. Um, uh, one wonders then what the uh, realistic means of reform in the future will be. If, if you look at something like the males, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a time when the only way to get uh, information from one person to another was, was sending it giving it to a government bureaucrat and having them deliver it. But in the meantime, I guess innovation, private sector, sort of ingenuity, uh, technology, all these things have worked together. So now we have many options, even though the law was really never changed. Do you, do you know what I mean? Right. So so you could have Federal Express and UPS and every, you know, email and all the rest of it. So, you, you know, you wonder if maybe the future of education might might follow a similar path. Oh, I think definitely. Just the rise of alternate forms of education, just the the cost of certain publications gets lower and lower. Things, more and more things are on the internet now, and there's beyond just the availability, there's also places such as the Mises Institute that that their whole function is to package and distribute that information in ways that the consumer can can readily digest. And then there's also different hierarchies so that you can certify in a in a voluntary sense the product that you're selling so that people know okay is this 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 website I'm going to is this just some wacko's website his homepage or is this something I can trust the information and people who are new to the internet or just heard it described would probably think there'd be no means by which you could tell if something were legitimate or not but yet as everyone who uses the internet yeah. knows you can tell pretty you know. quickly if yeah. somebody sends you a link with some crazy news story you can tell pretty quickly is this legitimate or not if yeah. it's you know something like the New York Times or whatever that you know at least it's gone through official channels and it's not someone making something up necessarily but um whereas if it's it's something you've never heard of and it just looks sloppy so there's there's built-in mechanisms by which people can can evaluate the content and again things that you could go to institutions and receive certificates and other sorts of designations to to show to others that I received this type of training and just more on the job training. It's this is obvious stuff, but most of what people do in their day to day life is not necessarily something they learned in calculus class in eleventh grade. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get back to that as as a last point, but before we get to that, um but just an observation on uh, some ways in which maybe public schooling is currently sort of being privatized in piecemeal. If you look at booster programs, they're mostly all private money. Mm-hmm. There's sports programs and music programs and chess clubs and choirs and all the rest of it. There's a lot of parental involvement. And those are the parts of public schools that work best. Exactly. And that also ties in with the one of the fundamental problems of government schooling is this issue of once everything is going through the government and it's the community's decision, then there's all these conflicts that arise. And so I remember in my hometown of Rochester, New York, there was an issue that the the school budget was insufficient. They were were in the red, and they were going to threaten, and I'm sure people have heard this story all over and over, that, oh, if we don't raise taxes, property taxes, then we're going to have to shut down the buses, and we can't get kids to go to school anymore. We're going to have to take away football. And that was what they would do. 
instead of saying we're going to get rid of all these mid-level managers or all these bureaucrats involved with the public educational system, they were going to, oh, there's going to be no football this year unless you guys raise your taxes. And so because of ridiculous things like that, yeah, there were private initiatives and, and local restaurants would sponsor the football team and things like that. And so they would get the money somehow. And again, just the, the private sector filling the gaps to avoid these absurdities. But the whole conflict there being caused by the fact that it's the community making these decisions. And I remember there were there was a, a photo of these elderly people in the room and these high school kids were just literally crying and just pointing fingers at them because the the idea was you greedy old people you aren't agreeing to allow me to to have a, a softball team i can't believe how greedy you are and the point is that would never happen in a market just as yeah. students who want to go buy dave matthews cd they don't go up to old people and say why don't you go buy some of those cds and then you lower the unit cost for the rest of us you greedy old people it just it wouldn't even occur to someone to make that yeah. accusation um, and on your point about about um, about the need to, to constantly learn, uh, it's an impression that I have that uh, sometime between World War, the end of World War II, and about ten years ago, there was a, a, a cultural wide assumption that that you learn pretty much what you need to learn by the age of twenty two, then you find a job, you stick with it, and you pretty much do that until mm -hmm. you retire and you get a, a a watch or a clock or something like that, <laughs> right. and you live off Social Security, and that's the end of it. But Nobody these days accepts that. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact that in, in any kind of work you're in, unless you're willing to constantly climb a learning curve, mm -hmm. learn new skills and learn new things and try new technologies, you're really going to get going to get mowed down. Right, and it's it's funny because that's again one of the big complaints against the the cutthroat market economy that it used to be the case. Once you found a nice company, you were there for life and they took care of you and it was more like a family. But now and today these companies don't yeah. care about their workers and they'll ship your job to Mexico if it saves them a few cents. And it's just I think of course the a healthy trend that yeah. the US economy is no longer as, as dominant as it used to be and that's a good thing yeah. for both the consumers and the the shareholders of those companies and even the workers to the extent that they are motivated to learn new skills and to find their proper niche in the global economy. Yeah. And so you're you're exactly right. The people now are expected to continue learning. You might work at six different areas in your life, right? Whereas before, once you found the company you were going to stay in, you liked their health benefits and that's where you were until you died. Yeah. Probably probably the future is going to look a lot more like um like it wasn't before World War II, you know, where there was constant innovation, it was just assumed that you had to work your whole life, for example, mm -hmm. and, and you had to learn your whole life. Right. Yeah. One point that you mentioned before that I wanted to come back to was painting the picture of how would a completely free educational mm -hmm. market look like. You talked about finance, and one thing I forgot to mention was you could still receive loans, student loans, and because, again, what's the the rationale for publicly funding students is that, oh, well, once – it would be absurd for some poor student off the street who's a genius to not be able to go on and get a higher degree. But, of course, to the extent that it really is absurd, well, then there's a huge profit opportunity. There's gains from trade that why wouldn't – if it really is true that there's some really poor student somewhere who is going to be a genius and would make thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars if only they could go to, to college, well, then it's going to be in some bank or some other group's interest – to give them a loan. And on top of that, there could be charitable organizations because I think charity would certainly be augmented if the state weren't providing all these so-called sure. public funding of, of things. And so to the extent that we as a society will not tolerate kids not being able to go to school, well, then fine. There would be presumably schools even just out of goodwill would probably let local students in for free because mar the marginal cost of teaching somebody right. arithmetic is fairly low. Or people who wanted to set up endowments to fund scholarships for certain students, just not because it redounds to the benefit of the of the institution, but just because they feel like that's something good that ought to be done, sure. they would be able to do that. And they would have at least twice as much income tomorrow to do it if the government would stop stealing their money. It, 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 it does strike me that there's a number of things that we notice are heavily in political demand. You know, for mm -hmm. example, you know, assisting the poor mm -hmm. with making sure that they get a good education. That in a free society, in a, in a purely laissez-faire system, would be converted to a, 
not a political demand, but to a market demand in a way. Exactly. That would be, in other words, as you said, we as a society would not tolerate. Right, and yeah. it's and it's not merely that your money is being taken from you right now, and so you have yeah. that much less to spend, but also the resentment that, as I think it was Ebenezer Scrooge says something to the effect when they, yeah. they ask him for a donation, he says, "No, aren't there? Doesn't the government <laughs> take care of? Isn't there a dole or something?" So, yeah. it's uh, the whole mentality would be different in churches and other organizations because that's the thing. Even I fall into this trap myself. You don't want to picture it just as a pure um, business transaction where there's just paying customers and that's it. There could also be third parties, charitable sure. organizations, endowment funds set up and, and church groups and s civil groups and things, all sorts of things like that. The only difference would be they couldn't take their funds at gunpoint from someone else. That's the only thing that wouldn't be there. And, yeah. and yet everyone says, no, no, that system would be unthinkable. That yeah. What sort of horrible society would that be where you can't raise funds through force? Okay. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And it's contrived and that it does, it's not realistic, but even on its own terms, it's, it has to be a very specific type of decision where there's a whole continuous range of things and then the idea is the market underprovides. But you're right that it could be applied all over the place in any aspect of life and we could find that there's market failures and everything. I recall reading a, a, an unpublished paper by, by Murray Rothbard. He had written as a, as a graduate student. He was complaining that the uh, administration at the time, I guess it was the Eisenhower or somebody, um, had been going on about the uh, terrible shortage of, of mathematicians and scientists, you know, that the, mm. that, uh, that the education system is not providing that and that there needs to be some sort of intervention. Uh, well, I mean, we still hear that today. Right. right? Just constantly. There's, there's always... Somebody has a better idea about precisely what people ought to learn. Right. Just everything in terms of research and development, I can remember even in graduate school that there were models of R&D. And of course, it was just obvious, y'all knew going into it, that <laughs> it was going to be the market can't do it correctly. And so it was, there's really a whole industry in mainstream economics of different ways the market can screw up. And by the market, they mean decentralized decision making where people decide things based on just their own costs and benefits. And it's ironic because it actually, you have to be clever to come up with ways that the market screws up because in general with a price system, people do what's the socially optimal thing going back to at least Adam Smith's formulation of the invisible hand. And so that's why it takes these clever PhDs at MIT to come up with all these models in which, oh, the market's going to fail here. Right. But, but of course, it just begs the question of Therefore, since there's this theoretical market failure, the government, of course, can identify it, and we can trust the government to implement the solution. Right. Uh, well, the, uh, the rigorous models aside, um, there is something like a public intuition that most people have that seems to suggest that education is, is something like a service unlike any other. You know, the, there, there's a, a popular view out there that, that really can't imagine uh, that... The, goods uh, type logic is that if you construe a public, public good broadly enough, everything qualifies. Right. That's exactly true. So it's not just vaccines and things they really have made the argument for, but Austrians have taken it and say, why, if I put on a clean pair of socks in the morning, that that's a public right. good, that it, it benefits me, but it also benefits everyone else that I interact with. And it doesn't follow, therefore, that we need to subsidize people putting on clean socks. And again, it's I think we should think through as to specifically what's going wrong with the argument, the public goods approach there. Right. It's that on the margin, even though you have that spillover effect, just considering your own costs and benefits, most people are going to put on a clean pair of socks. And so it's the same thing when it comes to education, that the type of thing that people are talking about to, to learn how to read and, and arithmetic and things like that, stuff that you really need to know in order to function in society – I think people left to their own devices, even if they don't care anything about their neighbor's welfare, just in terms of their own marketability and, and what kind of wage they're going to get when they graduate, they're going to choose to get that sort of minimum education. Right. But as I understand the, the rationale for the, the public goods argument, it's not that uh, the market means won't provide education, that it won't, it's that it won't provide it in sufficient quantity or the type of quality, I suppose, that... Uh, that economists somehow know for sure as necessary. Right, and that's that's what I mean when I'm saying, of course, yeah. you could theoretically, if you're going to devise an actual model, 
in the little world of the model, you can show that, oh, there's a market failure. Yeah. But what's crucial there is there needs to be a continuous range of of choice so that you're choosing to take 20 semesters of a certain in a certain area or a certain liberal arts education. And so the argument would be, oh, left to their own devices, people would only take 14 semesters, whereas we know the optimal amount would be 20, for example, just to make up numbers. But if it's something that's a, a binary choice, such as learning how to read or not, well, then there, even if you accept the public goods argument, it's it's not going to get the inefficient outcome. Yeah. So it's it's not merely that the argument educated that's better for everyone else in the society as well. It doesn't follow that, therefore, that person can't be trusted to choose the level of his or her own education on their own. And so I think that that's the the primary objection to the public goods argument in terms of just the the theory of it is that on the margin people will choose to get education that for example literacy it's not as if people aren't going to because of the benefits to themselves of becoming literate that they're going to choose not to learn how to read or that parents aren't going to teach their children how to read because they're neglecting the spillover effects to everyone else from having one more literate person in society yeah. and so that's i think the 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 major theoretical problem with the public goods argument. And then, of course, just the practical ones that, for example, another, it, it's it's really the same argument, but a different way that they usually frame it is that they say there are benefits to having a responsible, informed citizenry. In a, yeah. in a modern democracy, we need to have educated citizens, and that's why. Mm -hmm. And so we could go through that argument. I just gave you a more theoretical one and, and say, well, is it really the case that you wouldn't want to be an informed citizen on your own and you need to be forced to. But even beyond that, just to look at in the real world, does anyone think that the U.S. educational system right now is churning out informed citizens who are making responsible decisions at the ballot box? And I think most people would agree that that's not the case. Just with the, the anecdotes, the funny things we hear about how, what percentage of high school seniors knows where particular countries are on a map and, right. and what the U.S. Constitution is or what year it was signed and things like that, that clearly – the system is not producing well-informed citizens. And so if that's the argument for so-called public education, then I think it's obviously been a failure. Well, one of the rejoinders to that is that, well, look, if you, if you uh, 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 reduce the amount of funding available for public education, it can only make the system worse. Right. You could yeah. say that about anything, just yeah. as whenever a government program screws up, whether it's the war on poverty right. or inner-city housing and so on, that they just say, oh, yeah, it's because we need more money. Well, speaking of things you could say that about anything about, um, uh, it's, uh, I guess one of the Austrian criticisms of public... The, the argument runs something like this, that it's true when you go to school and receive instruction, it raises your productivity, and so it directly benefits you, but it also has spillover effects, positive externalities on everyone else in the society. And so that's why it's in the public interest to both have compulsory attendance laws and also to have state funding of education that if there's a person who's too poor to go to college for example but yet that person's an excellent student and, and would do well then the argument is oh we should use tax funds to send that person to college because it's going to benefit the rest of us as well so as with most arguments of this nature i think one of the major criticisms that the advocate of the free market could level is that you need to focus on the actual decisions on the margin. And so just because something has a spillover effect, even if we concede the legitimacy of, of that way of thinking, it doesn't necessarily follow that therefore provision will be too small in a market setting. Just to give you an, an analogy, another example they often use is when it comes to vaccination. And the argument there is the government needs to force everyone to get vaccines because even though left to their own devices, most people would choose to do it you're only narrowly considering your own selfish benefits and you're not considering, well, if I catch whatever this communicable disease is, then not only am I sick, but then I'm going to spread it to a thousand other people. And that the argument goes, if you were forced to externalize, internalize all those externalities, you would then choose to get the vaccine, whereas left to their own devices, people are too uh, short-sighted and too selfish to think like that. But if you think about that, it, it's true, theoretically, you could devise some sort of model in which people are neglecting those those facets of the decision. But in reality, I think most people, just considering my own benefit, do I want to get polio or tuberculosis, they're going to 
get the vaccine, even though they're disregarding the fact that, oh, well, if I get this, then I'm going to be a person to spread it on to others. And so in the same way, when it comes to education, even if we concede that, yes, of course, other things equal if someone's this is another lecture in the in the home study course. This time we're covering the topic of education with Professor Robert Murphy. And let's first address, we're presuming that the readings are covering lots of the history from Rothbard. So um, in this discussion, we'll cover, cover some of the more uh, theoretical aspects of, um, of public schools, uh, state control of education, the viability of a market order, and some other topics along the way, whatever happens to come up. Let's start with the, the first, first issue of why it is that uh, uh, education is considered a public good. Or is it usually considered to be a public good in the economic liter economics literature? Yes, it is. And that it's interesting, just the, the terminology they employ, that it's called uh, public schooling. And so right there, that loads loads the issue against the person who wants to argue for private provision. So really what people mean when they talk about public schools, of course, are, are government schools. And then I think even myself, I fall into that trap when I'm writing about this, and I always try to come back and, and correct myself and go through and, and change any place where I put public school to government school so that I myself am not perpetuating that stereotype. And also, just as an aside with this term, terminology, the really what we're talking about in this area is – is formal schooling and not education. And so, again, to talk about public schools providing education, the you don't want to fall into the trap of saying, oh, are you for or against education? Because, of course, we're right. all for education. And so the thing to remember is whether or not someone is compelled to sit in a, a particular building and hear instruction from designated experts, that doesn't mean that person, therefore, that's the only route to education that people on their own can can read and so forth and that people can continue to learn to receive an education well beyond formal schooling years. So I think we need to keep those issues in mind. But to go back to what you were asking, yes, in the mainstream literature, education is considered a classic public good, perhaps second only to defense or provision of a legal structure. 